you probably know enough now that you could you could go in these directions if you want. So some things about multi-rigid body systems and impulsive dy dynamics. Before that, there were some things related to interesting dynamics of rolling that I wanted to show. So there's, there's rolling um, rigid bodies that do odd things. Um, let's see if I've got them. <clears throat> when I was a kid, uh, we had this thing called Tommy Tippy. I don't know what they call it now, but it was this, it had a heavy weight at the bottom and it was sort of a rounded bottom. You'd fill this thing with fluid. And if you tried to move it one way or, or the other, it would just sort of uh, bounce back. So it had a restoring force. I don't think they have them anymore. I looked up this company and they don't, they don't do this. Um, this is like, these are pictures of a vintage Tommy Tippy. Um, but there's a, there's a problem in Greenwood that's a lot like the Tommy Tippy, basically a rounded bottom. And then depending on where you put the center of mass, you'll get some different dynamics. And you could look at the 3D motion of it. I couldn't find a Tommy Tippy. I found this thing with a rounded bottom and it kind of, kind of mimics the behavior, it just goes back. It's it's like a 3D version of that rolling block problem. And you can get some some strange behavior. I never thought of turning my Tommy Tippy around. Um, there's something related to it called the Tippy Top. And this is, if you just look up Tippy Top, it's this top, you spin it, it's got a rounded bottom, and then it slowly tips over. So, whoa, that's crazy. Um, here's a simulation where they, they've taken something and the, they're slowing it down five times. And I think then they'll now slow it down 25 times at that point where it, the point of contact shifts. So there's, um, this has fascinated people like, uh, these are some, Wolfgang Pauli and Niels Bohr, some famous physicists um, last century, and they're, they're staring at a tippy top on, on the ground. That's back when physicists wore suits. Now they usually look unkempt. Um, there's also something surprising happens when you spin an egg. This isn't a real egg. I didn't want to make a mess or anything. This is a plastic egg. I've got it slowed down. And you can even see the flickering of the lights if you look carefully. So I'm spinning an egg on its side. This is slowed down eight times. And you'll see what happens is it actually wants to spin on its end. And it doesn't matter. This, so this is a hollow plastic egg shell. It doesn't have to be the egg shell. It could be a solid egg. And you, you'd still get the same behavior, which you know, it's pretty weird with the egg. Um, let me see, you, you can see it's definitely on its side and it's about to fall and make some problems. Um, and if, if you want to know more, maybe I can post some papers about that. So that's some surprising, weird rolling stuff. And there's still mysteries about it. People are still trying to study things like that. Like there's there's papers on the theoretical mechanics of how the tippy top works. Even, even in these days. Um, we've mostly talked about single rigid bodies because single rigid bodies in 3D are complicated enough. But if you've got a multi rigid uh, body system You can still use, you can still use basically the like D'Alembert's principle. And whether you use things like quasi velocities if you have constraints or just the regular generalized coordinates, um, we'll still get correct things. So if you use D'Alembert's principle for N rigid bodies, 
And here's, let me just sort of show some, there's a couple of rigid bodies and imagine this is in 3D and there's some kind of joint here. <clears throat> then there would be a, let's call this body one and this is body two. If we have, this is the point P, sort of a point of, it's a pivot point. There'll be a force, say on particle uh, or rigid body two at point P. And that's going to be because of the equal and opposite reaction force negative of the uh, force on particle one at that same point. And so because of that, and then doing D'Alembert's principle, um, the moments and the forces due to this constraint of a joint are workless. So they end up not showing up in the equations of motion. And that's something you can, you can prove. Um, and it doesn't matter if there's, you know, n bodies, as long as if you, if you have, if you have workless constraints, I mean, those are constraints that do no work. They can be, you know, effectively ignored, but what we're really doing is projecting them out. You only look at the directions in which there is dynamics you know, to get uh, equations of motion for generalized coordinates. And there, there are books kind of dedicated to modeling multi-rigid body systems, like modeling very complicated things, like complicated engineering machinery. I just want to mention one um, it's called an acrobat because it, it looks kind of like an acrobat. So if I, where's this? This looks good. Uh, yeah, here's, here's an acrobat. And it shows how it got its name. It's a, it looks like an acrobat on the, the high bar. So this picture on the left is someone on, on the high bar and you can effectively model that as two segments. There's a pin joint, see down here, there's a pin joint and all of the actuation is happening at the, you know, the bending of the torso. So you could look at this as just two masses and the only actuation happens right at the, the middle joint. So it's it's the same as a, um, let me draw this. It's like a double pendulum. So if we had some point here, um, and you've got two rigid bodies, with a pin joint, so. It's basically a double planar pendulum, but with rigid bodies instead of just masses at the ends of sticks. So if we have this point O and I don't know, let's call this point P and you could use some coordinates to describe this. So the, the typical position of this will be, you know, theta one is about pi or 180 degrees and theta two is also about 180 degrees. But the the only actuation happens here. So we could say there's some applied torque. Same thing here, applied torque. And if you were to write the equations of motion for this, you could use, um, Theta one and theta two is your generalized coordinates. Write a Lagrangian that includes the kinetic and potential energy due to gravity for both of them. And then you would have, um, what's this? Partial L, partial theta I dot 
d by dt minus partial l partial theta i equals we've been writing q what is it uh, n c the generalized force and this would be in this case we've got two rigid bodies k goes from one to two uh, we've got the force on body two dotted with this partial bk partial theta i dot plus the moment and this is the we should remind ourselves non-conservative so that means it's not inside doesn't come from a potential energy function u this is dot partial omega k partial theta i dot and the only, the only non-conservative uh, force or moment we have would be right at this joint up here. So how would that get uh, worked on? If this is point O and this is point P, we would have a moment up here. So this would be the moment, non-conservative moment on particle two um, is equal to tau as a vector. So that means this would only show up in Q and C2 equals tau. And the question that roboticists have asked is, well, okay, this tau could be a function of time and my generalized coordinates and their time rates of change or whatever. How do I pick this uh, control torque to achieve some outcome? Maybe. This thing starts in the downward position and I want to swing up much like the acrobat does. So then it becomes a problem of finding that. Um, in fact, there's, a, there's this paper, the swing up control problem for the acrobat. And they, you know, they go through it all. But it can be solved. Let me show you. This is a short video of them doing the swing up problem. So this is the acrobat. So there's only actuation at this middle joint. It's just below where the play button is. And they'll do some uh, uh, the swing up. So they get it going. And you know it looks a lot like an acrobat. I don't know what they use as the control algorithm here. Right? There's many, many courses you can take on how to do controls. And then this thing balances. And it's got some stability. He'll come and tap it. A ginger tap and there it goes. But you can make it do other things. Um, so how learn how to pick that is a, would be a problem in controls. And then if you want it to be like robust to perturbations and things. You can do that, but and I wrote Lagrange's equations here. You could also use, you know, you could use Newton Euler to get equations of motion as well. But Strange things can happen when you have two rigid bodies, even kind of in the absence of control. There's this, um, especially when you've got conservation of angular momentum. There's this paradigm, and I originally heard it um, as Elroy's beanie. I don't know if you've heard of the Jetsons. But there's Elroy's beanie. Elroy uh, was like the kid on the show. I don't know where Elroy's beanie is. Oh gosh, yeah. It's, I mean, this isn't Elroy, but this is kind of the picture. The idea is, if you're, if you were out in space, then viewed from the top, you're sort of your body, and then attached by a joint uh, a pin joint is the beanie so this is the bean like the little propeller thing on top 
So you have your kind of propeller and you could you know, reach up and spin it. But if you're out in space, you have nothing to push off of. So if you're Elroy, this you know, happy guy right here, and you wanna be turning to the right 90 degrees, what would you do? Well, you could hit your propeller, even though it's much smaller mass. I guess, let's say this is Elroy. And you make the propeller spin in the opposite direction that you wanna go. And because you started out at zero angular momentum, as your propeller spins one way, you, and it might spin many times one way, you will slowly rotate to face the other way. And then you reach up and grab your propeller and stop it. So this would be, um, let's put some coordinates here for the, the angle of the propeller. Let's call that phi. And the uh, you know, overall, we've got theta equals the orientation of Elroy. Uh, this phi is, this is the relative orientation of the propeller. This isn't a propeller in the usual sense that it's gonna do any propulsion. And then you could write conservation of total angular momentum. And let's suppose uh, Elroy it has a moment of inertia I1 and the propeller has a moment of inertia I2 and I1 is gonna be much greater than I2. It's much harder to rotate Elroy than his propeller. But conservation of total angular momentum, it's gonna say, we just write what the angular momentum is. And we're only looking at the kind of out of screen component. So this would be uh, I1 theta dot uh, plus I2 theta dot plus V dot. And this is equal to a constant. So whatever you started with. So if we started at rest, then this is zero. So we can just rewrite this. Um, and you would get that theta dot equals negative I2 over I1 plus I2 uh, phi dot. But then what do these dots mean? These dots mean, so this is d theta dt, d phi dt. And so, uh, you, the, d, the dt's cancel. And so all that matters is that your change in theta, maybe we'll write it as delta theta. Your change in uh, theta, that means how Elroy will change his orientation is this simple um, constant. It's negative of this positive constant times delta phi. So if you wanna turn Elroy 180 degrees or not 90 degrees, then you need to figure out, well, how much does my propeller have to turn the opposite way? So yeah, if I, if not L, not I, this is Elroy. If the, if the propeller rotates through one turn, that means delta phi is uh, two pi. So every time that goes two pi, how much do I, does this, uh, does Elroy move negative? Negative uh, I2, remember, which is much smaller, over I1 plus I2, two pi. And you could figure out how many turns. So if you find yourself out in space with a propeller on your head, you know what to do. No, this, so this concept of um, what's, what's interesting about this formula is that there's time is not in here. The propeller could take 10,000 years 
to, to go to pi and it won't change where uh, Elroy ends up. So even though this is supposedly related to dynamics, it's more just how much one thing rotates compared to the other. So that's interesting. Um, this gets used surprisingly in the animal world you, with um, animals have tails. And sometimes it's not clear you know, why do animals have tails? Uh, and one thing that they found out is that, you know, tails, tails uh, have large angular momentum and can be used for orientation control. So this was studied by a, a group in Berkeley. They looked at lizards jumping, leaping lizards. So they have the, this is, this is a, a lizard schematic sort of jumping and you could break it up into two parts, sort of the main body of the lizard here in blue and then it's tail. And then there's some hinge joint you know, here. And by turning its tail, right, you'll get an instant pitch response of the lizard. So lizards use their tail to control pitch when they're airborne. So we're talking about leaping lizards Leaping lizards, Batman. Um, and this was this was an interesting study because then they thought, oh, what if we put a tail on a robot? And you might like, why would I ever want to put a tail on a robot? That's just some unnecessary thing animals have. Well, no, maybe it's not unnecessary. Maybe you want to put tails on robots. Um, so, so they these are the experiments. Tail assisted pitch control. So they'll, they're, this is going to show a video of they're getting this lizard to jump. And this is off kind of a normal surface. And then you can see they can look at the angle of the lizard and the, the angle of its tail. And now here they gave it a slippery surface. So it has to do a pitch up maneuver. And now they do a high friction surface and it has to do a pitch down maneuver. And how does it pitch down? It moves its tail down. Ooh, really cool. Um, let, me, let me stop that because the, the intuition comes from this picture of why it's doing this. If you've ever seen someone on the high bar or I guess, no, it's a balance something, the high wire high wire, acrobat on the high wire. Maybe they'll use their hands to kind of balance and that's the exact same effect. Or they'll have this giant bar, much like the lizard's tail, the giant bar, the balance bar. If they are, if they want to turn one way, they turn the, the bar the opposite way so that they can maintain balance. Well, that's, that's the same thing that the, uh, the lizard's doing. If it senses it, when it's airborne, it has nothing to push off of. So what can it do? It can move its tail and it can move its body up or down. So that's pretty neat. Um, let me jump to the middle here because they did, they added a tail to a robot. So this is a, um, this is a little robot car jumping off of a, a, a ramp. And so this is just letting the tail move passively. And right, just like we expected, because of the jump off, you get this slight rotation. Well, what if you wanted to maintain an orientation while you're airborne Then you can have an active tail? So they do this and in real time, it's just going too fast. So they like, okay, once we jump off, we'll uh, actuate the tail just so, so we keep the pitch of our little flying car going the same. So, so that's pretty cool. 
You probably didn't know what tails were for, and now you do. And you can even come up with a quantity of the effectiveness of a tail. So tail, take this over here, like delta theta delta phi from up above equals negative I2. That's the moment of inertia of the tail divided by the sum of the moments of inertia. And this quantity, you could call this the tail effectiveness. And it's just due to the ratio of moments of inertia. So, you know, right, you could have a heavy short tail or a lighter longer tail, and you'll still get, you know, large moment of inertia. That's pretty wild. So, put tails on robots. Um, I'm looking here, what I got. Yeah, there's there's other things related to a uh, tail. Well, conservation of angular momentum. Let me show you this. I think I've showed before the where the the demonstration where you can spin a tire or spin a gyroscope and then it kind of moves around. What if you're sitting in a swivel chair and someone spins a tire? very, very, very rapidly. Well, you'll have some strange behavior. It'll make you turn as you as you orient the, the wheel differently. If we were in class, I would show this, but okay. So let me see, how did he spin that again? Blah, blah, blah. He's spinning it um, in such a way that there's a large angular momentum pointing towards the guy with the black shirt and in the vertical direction, there is he's starting out at zero angular momentum. So as he moves things, as he moves that that wheel, there's different amounts of angular momentum. And to make it net zero, he moves a certain way. So this is sort of the idea of a, a using a gyroscope to do control and things, which gets used a lot in. Um, uh, satellites. Uh, it's also again used in the animal world. This is a photo of a cat. So starting from the top, the cat's up on a branch and then I don't know how the photographer did this. I guess the branch disappeared and using a strobe light, he caught the cat as it's uh, falling. Um, it's upside down, but it they're always able to reorient. So this is like, you know, how do cats do this? Um, and they're able to do it with not much room. They're, they just always reorient to land down. But, um, and this is a simulation. If you view the cat as two masses connected by a ball and socket joint, then even if it starts upside down and total zero angular momentum zero, it can move about that ball and socket joint to achieve uh, feet down. So going from feet up to feet down. This is a very abstract looking cat. Uh, but that's essentially what the cat does. So it's pivoting. It, I think it's moving its back body compared to its, the front part. And you can't just do this with a, a revolute joint. It has to be some kind of ball and socket joint to achieve this. And again, robots of the future will you know, have this. Um, let's see, there's, I think I mentioned something about reorienting. There was this book written when people were going to the moon before, before I was born. Um, and they talked about human attitude control. So if you break up the body into some segments, how do you achieve optimal reconfiguration if you're out in space? It's like you, there's these weird maneuver. I don't know what those diagrams mean, but you could like move your arms in such a way to, you know, change your pitch and get some roll and then move your arm back. It's probably easier if you see a, a, a video. There was a paper um, 
where they were looking at diving. So this is somebody diving and they move their arm and then that gets them spinning. This was like how to optimally do a, you know, multi-spin dive. And then you put your other arm back out and you complete the dive. Over here on the left, this is showing the, uh, instead of H, they're using L to represent the body axis components of angular momentum. And that, that's pretty cool. So you, you know, something similar to this would be used in space. How this differs from space, in space people usually assume you start from zero angular momentum. This is assuming after your jump from a diving board, you've got some angular momentum. And so then you get uh, some interesting behavior. So how to do optimal dives. Um, here is a, this is a toy car. And this, again, illustrates conservation of angular momentum. This toy car, the rear wheels, and I, I almost had a car just like this. You could get it for you know, one of those $5 places, pretty cheap. This isn't my video, but the, this thing is suspended by a string. He will turn on the car, and then it, it's rolling counterclockwise, and then he brakes it, and then you see that to conserve angular momentum, the whole thing starts going counterclockwise. And so you get this tumbling effect. And he's holding it when he starts accelerating. Otherwise, if he wasn't holding it, there'd be a counter motion of the, the car to counter the effect of the rotation. So hopefully you see what's going on here. Um, Ooh, am I able to draw on this? Cool. Let's use green. I don't know. Green. Blah, blah, blah. Too tiny. Yeah, good enough. All right. So as this spins, so we've got angular momentum about, um, yeah, about there. So total angular momentum at this point is zero. But when you break this wheel, that all that angular momentum has to now transfer into the motion of the whole system. So imagine that car jump problem that we looked at before. And if you recall, I said, ignore rotation of the wheels because it would have an effect. If you jump and then you put on the brakes in midair, that means that angular momentum goes into the rotation of the car and you will, you will pitch down, which you might not want. So this is a video from before. It looks like something from a Christopher Nolan movie toward the end. So, he puts on the brakes, and so he has this, he has pitch that's too high. This was, a, you know, they had a stunt team, and the uh, driver was all right. You can actually hear the engine cut out. This is from another view, but you can hear the engine cut out, I think. At least I can. Cuts out. So if you're doing a high-speed jump, don't put on the brakes in midair. Because there could be consequences. All right. So con that conservation of angular momentum has has other effects. Uh, so just be wary. Be wary. Conservation of angular momentum. It could be used for good, but it could also uh, mess you up. And you don't want that. Okay. Um, I just want to see. Yeah, this is. Hmm. Let me show. Yeah, you could use 
this idea of uh, conservation of angular momentum can lead to things like a restoring torque. There's a there's this system that you can put inside boats to keep them from rotating. I don't know if you've been on a boat, but if you get if you're in the wake of some other boat or there's actual waves coming, the boat will start start rocking and that can make you sick. <laughs> but if you put a, a some kind of gyro stabilizing thing, so you get a, a flywheel, you get mass, you get it spinning at, I don't know, 10,000 RPM. It wants to maintain uh, spinning about a certain axis. And so as waves come, it can counter the effect of the waves by doing the exact proper torque to balance out what's going on. This is a kind of fuzzy video. Um, yeah, once they have it unlocked and operating, then it can resist rocking motion. And this, this is an actual demonstration. One of the boats has this system in it and the other boat doesn't. And they're two like identical boats. To prove the difference between having the sea keeper on the boat and not having it. So they're in the wake of some other boat. Due to the calm sea state, we've had to simulate wave action in order to demonstrate the effectiveness. So of the, the boat on the left, it's the one the that had hit the, boat, the system really in it. You can see how the stabilized C-48 remains steady. Whilst the and what is this doing? I don't know. It's a difference of a couple of degrees or something. Richard, following the sea trial in those simulated test conditions, uh, tell me what you think of the effectiveness of the stabilizer. To prove the difference anyway. between having the sea keeper on. So that's the, that's for a boat. Um, there's another more views of what it looks like. A cutaway to the right and then the system kind of installed in a boat. Um, and there are certain sea disasters that could have been avoided where they capsized. And if they had a system like this, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, the larger the boat, the larger the system you need. Also for control of the uh, space station. So this is the type of, this is a gyroscope, the space station to keep the space station oriented. Um, I guess it gets slight perturbations from people moving around or equipment moving or even a uh, difference of solar radiation pressure on one side versus the other. So these control moment gyroscopes are used a lot in applications like that. Um, our control and stabilizing gyroscopes. The topic we didn't say much about is uh, impulsive dynamics. We said nothing about it. So impulsive dynamics, that's the where, you know, if you, if you drop a stick and then it impacts, what happens at impact and after impact? These are things that are considered instantaneous so uh, there was a whole chapter of the Kasdan and Paley that we didn't look at. So if you wanna know about impulsive dynamics, you didn't learn it here, but it does have important um, consequences. Um, there's, uh, especially when it combines with usual dynamics. So yeah, sticks falling is, is one thing, but there's, um, let me see if I can show this. There's where there was some work done 30 years ago studying biped walking. And is we think of uh, the way we walk is like this, uh, it's it's unstable and all that. Here's a very simple model. This is, uh, they call this the compass biped model. Just, you just have a large mass up at the top here, and then um, two smaller masses connected by sticks. And the mass that impacts that's on the ground is just sort of a pivot. And then this other 
mass over here is going to swing around. And as it swings, then it will actually impact. And then this other foot will go and be the one that swings. So this is a hybrid system of, we would say, what we've done throughout this course would be then summarizes continuous dynamics and impulsive dynamics. So there's ways to model what happens instantaneously to the uh, angular, the angular velocity and the translational velocity at impact. And if you do a careful modeling, right, you have to take into account what are the two types of materials and what's their elasticity and all that. Uh, so this is called the, the compass biped model. And there's been experimental and theoretical work related to it. So this is this is showing sort of a schematic of what I was saying about. Okay, starting from the upper left, this uh, the forward foot impacts the ground, and then the back leg swings forward, and then that's the new impacting foot in the lower right, and this all repeats. Um, this is showing on the left, we're sort of showing it in uh, its physical space. On the right, this is showing phase space and the colors correspond to the two different legs. So we've got theta and theta dot for each leg as it swings around and then impact happens and the impact dynamics corresponds to that little gap that you can see between the, uh, the solid points here on the right. So in phase space, there's this gap that's taken care of by the impact or impulsive dynamics. So there was a experimentalist named McGear and he, so this is a toy little thing. And if you get it set up right, this is made out of uh, some sticks and flexible things and it'll just naturally walk downhill. And it's passively stabilized. So this was sort of interesting, like, oh, things can walk passively stabilized. Okay, that's a toy. Is there a bigger model? And this is a really grainy kind of VHS video, 1990, if you can see. It's kind, it's creepy, but it walks stably and it's a very slight downhill ramp, but you could take that same concept and apply it to things going uphill. So, uh, a couple of people looked at taking that same idea of the passive dynamic walker and using it to make something walk uphill. And you can you can do that. So it's possible. But that requires some impulsive dynamics. Um, some other things related to impulsive dynamics. Do I have it here? Have you seen, let's see, do I have one in the video here? This is a, wow, it, it's green, so you can't see it. That's terrible. It's a popper. It's, uh, let's see something here. It's this little thing that you pop it through and then put it on the ground and then it pops up. So these are a couple of dogs looking at a popper that's about to pop. And it happens really fast. And they're like, what? what's going on? Here it is slowed down. So they're looking at it, it pops, and then there it goes up in the air. And they've got quick reflexes. This, the dog in the lower right is about to bite that thing. You know, he probably thinks it's a bug. Well, what is this popper doing? The popper is quickly releasing some stored elastic energy to achieve this huge jump compared to its size. So it's storing a, a lot of kinetic energy. And this gets used, again, going to the, the world of nature, the animal world. There are these ants called trap jaw ants. And uh, this is showing their mandibles. They've got these, you know, 
mouth things in front and they can, it's like they spring load them and then release. And it's very, very quick and frightening. Uh, this is just showing some of the ants in slow motion. Maybe we'll see, okay, here's uh, the closing of the ant jaw. And then we'll see some other closing of the ant jaw. And it's happening very, very quickly. But here's the thing, if this was pre if they were right next to a surface and they closed, they could launch themselves backwards and they do. And just like this popper thing, if you see it in real time, it looks instantaneous. Like there's an ant there and then instantaneously the ants far away. And so it's not, they use this to kind of get away from danger. It's like an ejection seat. Um, but what you want to see is this happening. So look at the ant on the, the left, the far left. They're there, they're pressing against like a piece of glass and I guess they sense danger or something and boom, they close their jaws and they launch themselves backwards. And if we did not have high speed video, you wouldn't see all this tumbling. And then they sort of land on the other side and they like, whoa, they could, <laughs> if they bite down on the ground, they shoot themselves straight up. If they do this against some kind of sideways surface, they kind of launch sideways. And it's kind of hilarious uh, to see, but they do this release of stored energy to achieve some goal. And it requires, um, if you were to estimate, you know, the dynamics of, you know, how, what's the launch velocity based on how quickly the jaws close, you'd need to do some impulsive dynamics, which like I said, we, we didn't cover, but you know, that's life. Um, so there's a trap jaw, ants, and um, toy poppers. So that's release of elastic energy. And if you were to do it carefully, impulsive dynamics. I mean, for the popper, there's even viscoelasticity. So a continuum mechanics type thing you'd have to look at if you're to really carefully model that. Um, you're sort of going towards from, you know, the multi-rigid body to a continuum. Uh, if you think of, you know, some kind of bunch of links, if you go from N links to, uh, you know, N goes to infinity, then you could have some kind of continuous thing. And I've done some study of snakes and it's just sort of natural to, even though snakes typically have, you know, N on the order of 200 vertebra. You may as well just make it continuous. So if you have a continuous body, you could still model this using uh, Newton Euler dynamics. It depends on what you're trying to do. What we've, we've done some work where we prescribe how the snake changes its shape. So it's like we're saying, here's how it's going to activate its muscles. And what is the resulting motion as it interacts with the outside world. Um, so much of this work has been with the flying snake. Here's a side view of a flying snake jumping in slow motion. So these are snakes that are not very big. I kind of have a model here. Again, it's green, so you can't see it, but it's pointless. They're about as wide as a garden hose and maybe three feet long but they can flatten their body. So they become a symmetric airfoil, a symmetric tandem airfoil, and they glide through the air. So they live in forests where they can jump from heights of like 40 or 50 meters. And uh, behaviorally, we don't really know why they're jumping, but they jump and it's cool. And um, you know, it's, this one's getting ready for landing. So oh, what do you know? It's using its tail to do some pitch control. 
and then uh, it hits the ground. They're also remarkable at being able to not get hurt when they land. Um, that would hurt me. Uh, they somehow avoid getting hurt. They could also jump into trees. This is showing some indoor experiments where we we put motion trackers on the body. This is seen from above and looked at their motion and through motion capture, we're able to recreate how the snake moves. And then we can do things like look at idealized snakes and study the distribution of forces, lift and drag. What we found is that they seem to have to undulate, otherwise they roll sideways or otherwise tip over. So snakes dipped in liquid nitrogen and thrown we, we would never do that. But if you did, they would uh, just sort of fall over. Somehow this undulation does not lead to propulsion. Right? It usually does, but leads to just staying stable, rotationally stable. So that's showing the distribution of lift and drag. And they're, they're fun objects, theoretically, because so this is a kind of a snake made up of n segments where n is large and we're showing the principal axes remember principal axes for rigid body if you assume instant that it's instantaneously a rigid body you could calculate principal axes but as this thing undulates the principal axes which are in red and blue in the middle they they move and they kind of move in this strange oscillatory way and so that that affects things. And this is just in one dimension. What about you have out of plane motion for the snake? You get all kinds of weird things going on. Let's see. Okay. So studying continuum systems, there's an effect of, uh, oops. The effect of changing shape uh, leads to um, like inertial effects. I guess we could just say changing shape leads to inertial effects. Because typically we think of the moment of inertia, we usually think of this as being constant, right? But if this thing changes with time, so if it changes with time, then new terms show up in the uh, um, in Euler's rigid body equation. Because it, it, at some point we made the assumption that that this thing equaled zero, but if it doesn't then you have another term. Um, so that is interesting, which means that how something changes its moment of inertia with time can be used to do some kind of control. And this isn't you know, unique to snakes. In fact, we based um, a lot of our work on, uh, it was a, a thesis related to satellites so out in space, multiple rigid bodies that are moving with respect to one another, changing the overall moment of inertia and how that would, could lead to doing control to reorient the satellite. So I don't know if this even has a name, change of moment of inertia control. Um, but even though mechanics is a very, very old subject, there's always some new application or new phenomena that we're discovering. And so hopefully you get some idea of that, at least from um, what we've talked about in this class and also this, this particular lecture that there's you know lots of different directions. Lots of different directions to take dynamics. And I mean, you're you're among the elite now. Lots of uh, engineers don't typically like dynamics. There's even whole categories of engineers who don't take dynamics. 
uh, I, but just the fact that you have taken this graduate level course means you you've got a leg up on every everybody.